Now my microphone has died and I don't have spare batteries on me at the moment, but if I just project, can everybody hear me okay even in the back? Okay, good, I just want to make sure. Well today I'm finishing up a series of sermons we've been doing on the sacramental life. And for those of you who might be guests today, you haven't you know, heard some of what we've been talking about the last few weeks. When I talk about the sacramental life, I'm talking about a life that is lived in such a way that it makes the grace of God visible for other people to see. After all, that's what a sacrament is. The sacraments that we in the Protestant Church celebrate and recognize are communion and baptism. And St. Augustine is the one who said that a baptism, or a sacrament, is a visible sign of God's invisible grace. It's something that makes God's grace not just a concept, but something we can see and touch and experience. And so the sacramental life is about living in the same way. Letting these two sacraments make an actual difference in the way we live. So that other people can see and experience the grace of God through us. That's what the sacramental life is about. Making God's grace more visible. And when God's grace becomes visible we get a better picture of what heaven is going to be like. So let us pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that as we take in your word to us again this morning, that you would take it and plant it in our hearts and cause it to grow and bear good fruit for the sake of your kingdom. We ask this in Christ's name. Scripture I'm reading is from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, and this is what the prophet says. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God, that we have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord, and we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. What will heaven be like? What do you picture when you think of heaven? That's the question that Isaiah is trying to answer for his people, his original readers, and for us today. What is heaven going to be like? That's what he's trying to describe. And instead of using some of the more stereotypical pictures that we think of, with, you know, sitting on clouds and playing harps, we don't see any of that in his description. What we see is a picture that is used all throughout the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments, and that's the picture of a banquet, a great feast that God is going to prepare, that God is going to host when the kingdom of God finally comes. And by the way, when I say kingdom of God and heaven, those are the same thing. Those are interchangeable terms. When the kingdom of God comes, when heaven arrives, this is what it's going to be like. It's going to be like this great feast that God throws for all people. Now, you fast forward a ways and you get to Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples. And I think the reason he chose the Last Supper, the reason he chose a meal around a table to be one of the sacraments of the church, the one that we practice over and over, that the church has been practicing for a couple thousand years now, is that Jesus wants this meal to be a preview of what heaven is going to be like. After all, again, Isaiah says it's going to be like a great feast, and Jesus says this feast that we have together as the people of God is a sample or a preview of exactly what Isaiah is talking about. So when we gather around this table, we have this bread, we have this cup. It's a sample, it's a picture, it's a foretaste of what heaven will actually be like. Think of it like when you go to Costco. 
You, you go to Costco on the weekend, even though it's crazy, but you're willing to brave it because the samples of the food are so good. And you get to have this free lunch. You circle the store like three times, pretending like you can't find what you want to buy because you want to sample all of the food, sometimes maybe even twice. Now, the sample that you taste, it's not just a, a symbol or a metaphor, it's the real thing. It's a real piece of food. And it, it gives you a preview of what it would be like if you bought the full package and cooked that for dinner tonight. That's why they give you the samples. So even though it's not the whole thing, it is the real thing. It's not the whole thing, but it is the real thing. That's what Jesus is doing for us at this communion table every time we gather around it. He's saying, this meal is the real thing. This is a, a snapshot of the kingdom of God actually happening right now. Now, it's not the whole thing. It's still going to arrive in all of its fullness when Jesus returns, but it is still the real thing. This sacrament of communion is a sample or a preview of the real thing of what heaven, the kingdom of God, is going to be like. And when I say that it's a sample of what it's going to be like, of course, I'm not just talking about what the food is going to taste like. It's not just a preview of how the food's going to be in heaven. Communion wants to do more than just that. It doesn't just want to prepare our palates. It wants to shape our character. When we come to this table, it's God's way of, of shaping us through this tradition into a people who behave a certain way in our daily lives. It builds up certain characteristics in us, because if we come to this table, we get a picture of what the kingdom of God will be like, and that influences how we're going to live the rest of our lives. What we see happening at this table previews for us how to live our lives in preparation for what heaven will actually be like. It wants to build, to build up this character in us, and that's also part of what Isaiah is giving us a picture of, not just... Again, not just the food and what it's going to taste like, but what life will be like in the kingdom of God. And it starts to shape that life in us now. And there are at least two or three characteristics that Isaiah is pointing to that God wants to shape in us through this communion meal. The first one is that through this meal, God wants to teach us to care about place. God wants to teach us to care about place. Isaiah says, he starts out the passage by saying, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare a great feast. On this mountain, and he's talking about the mountain where the city of Jerusalem still is today. That particular geographical spot on the planet. This mountain. In other words, this kingdom of God that is coming, the feast that God wants to host someday, is not just up there in heaven, someday God's going to throw this dinner and it'll be just out there somewhere. It's going to be here, on this dirt, on this ground where you live, is where God is going to prepare his feast in the kingdom of God. On this mountain, God cares about place. And he cares about the places in your life and in my life as well. The actual physical places where we spend our time. God cares about your house. He cares about your desk at work. He cares about where you go shopping. He cares about the classroom where you go to school. He cares about the actual physical places in your life. God doesn't just care about your spirituality. He cares about your geography, where you are and when. He cares about the specific places in your life. And what Isaiah wants us to do by telling us how much God cares about place is Isaiah wants us to start asking the question, for any given place in my life, whether it's the church this morning, when we go back home, whatever place we're in, what would it look like? If tomorrow God set up his feast of the kingdom of God in that place, how would it transform that place? How would it look different? How would my work look different? How would our home look different? How would the places we go shopping, the places we drive, how would those places look different if tomorrow that's where God set up his great feast? 
again, it would absolutely transform all of those places. In fact, that's, that's the business that God is in, transforming the places in our lives and the places on this earth. One of the interesting things about this passage is that it comes in the middle of a very depressing part of Isaiah. The little part that we read is very hopeful. It's a picture of heaven. But before it, Isaiah has been describing the way things really were at that point in history for Jerusalem. And they were bad. The people of God had been in exile for a long time. They had just come back. The temple hadn't been rebuilt. The walls around the city hadn't been rebuilt. It was a pitiful example of a city. It was a place that other nations made fun of. And Isaiah says, that's the way things are right now. But on that very same mountain, in this very same messy and broken place, that's where God wants to set up his kingdom. The messy and the broken places in your life, the dark places in our neighborhoods, that is where God wants to set up his kingdom because he will absolutely transform those places. And that is what God wants to do. And so when we take communion together, it reminds us that this physical place matters. That the place we are in is a place God cares about and wants to transform. So God cares about place. The second thing that communion teaches us is to care about people. Isaiah makes a point of saying that the Lord will make a feast for all peoples. And in the, the parable that we read that Jesus told, same thing. It's a feast that ends up being for all people. This will not just be a feast for the churchgoers, for the people we think of as God's people. This will not just be a feast for the religious elite, for the spiritually disciplined, for the morally good. This will be a feast to which all people are invited. Again, one of the interesting things in this passage is the fact that not just God, that God invites all the different nations, all the different people, but the fact that God invites human beings at all. <coughs> the idea of a deity throwing a banquet was not a new concept at this time in history when Isaiah was writing this. There are other writings out there from this period in history of other religions talking about the gods holding feasts and banquets to which they invite all the other gods. So they don't invite people. Maybe occasionally there's a story about some very special person that gets invited, a human being, but it's almost always just the gods that get invited. So the idea of a god, of the god, inviting all human beings to this feast means that God is going completely outside of his circle. Everybody that's invited is outside of God's circle, outside and beneath God's status. Those are the people that God wants to invite. And so, if communion, if this simple meal that we partake of once a month or so, is a preview of the kingdom of God, then it means that communion is an outsider's meal. It means the banquet that God wants to throw in heaven is an outsider's meal. The whole purpose of communion is to pr provide for us an occasion to go out to the highways and the hedges and invite outsiders to come in. In other words, communion is all about evangelism. Sharing the good news and extending more and more invitations to more and more people. It is an outsider's meal and it teaches us to care about the people outside of our regular circle of friends. So communion teaches us to care about place, it teaches us to care about people, it also teaches us to care about process. Two times at the end of this passage in Isaiah, he quotes the people of God as saying, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him. This is our God. We have been waiting for Him. At this meal is where we say to everybody else in the world, This is our God. This is what he is like. This is why we have been waiting for him. Waiting is simply a part of the Christian faith. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of what we do. It has always been this way. 
back before the time of Christ for the Israelites. They were people who knew what it was like to wait. And Isaiah knew this too. He's not a pie-in-the-sky kind of a prophet. He, he's a realist. He understands how hard it is to wait for God. Especially when it seems like God is so delayed in coming. So delayed in keeping His promises. Sometimes that's why we ask, where is this kingdom of God that Jesus said He was coming back soon? It's been a couple thousand years. Where is He? It seems like it's taking an awfully long time. Isaiah knows that we wait for God and that that's not always an easy thing to do. We are waiting for God's kingdom to come. We experience waiting in other areas of our lives. We're, we're waiting for our families to be less broken. We're waiting for solutions to the violence in our, our cities and in other countries. We're waiting to stop hearing about ISIS in the news. We're waiting for somebody to come up with a vaccine for Ebola. We're waiting for solutions to these problems. Sometimes we wait an awfully long time. Waiting is what takes up most of our lives. Which is why God often does His best work in us while we are waiting. See, our great fear about waiting is that it's a waste of time. That's why we hate waiting. We, we feel like it's a waste of time. But if you think about it, it's while we are waiting that most of the best and most beautiful things in life actually happen. Since most of our life is spent waiting, that's when most of the beautiful things in life happen. It's while you're waiting to grow up that you get to be young. It's while you're waiting to get married or to have kids or to be successful that you get to live with your strings attached. And even while you are waiting through suffering, while you are waiting through a time of pain in your life, that is when you usually get to know the grace of God better than any other time. It's hard, but that's when you get to know God's grace the best. Waiting on God does not mean that you only encounter God someday in the future. Waiting is how we experience God now. God is with His people who wait. And God cares about this process of waiting for this feast to come in all of its forms. And so communion, when we gather around this table, it's our chance to say to everybody else, look, look, this is the God that we have been waiting for. This is a preview of what things will be like in the kingdom of God. A table where everybody is invited. There are no divisions. There is no violence. There are no more tears. There are no more problems in life because the kingdom of God has come. This is what it looks like. This is the God we have been waiting for. It's our chance to say that God is keeping His promises. He has kept His promise by sending us His Son, Jesus Christ, to offer us salvation through His body and His blood, which we celebrate through the bread and the cup. It's our chance to experience a preview of what the kingdom of God will be like when it comes to its fullness. So God, again, God cares about place, He cares about people, and He cares about the process of waiting, and this meal teaches us to do the same thing. It teaches us to care about the, these things now in our daily lives, and it shapes how we live. It might seem a little bit strange, it certainly feels strange to me to preach about communion on a Sunday when we're not taking communion. I keep going back to this table, there's no bread and there's no cup up there right now. It feels a little strange to do that. But I wonder if it's not appropriate, especially in light of this concept of waiting and God meeting us in the waiting. Because just as we are in between communion meals right now, we usually celebrate communion on the first of the month, and we're in between those meals right now. In the same way, we are in between the inauguration of God's kingdom in Jesus Christ and the full consummation of God's kingdom when Christ returns. We live in the already but not yet. We're in between. When Jesus was raised from the dead and inaugurated the kingdom of God, it's happening now. It's breaking into our world now, but it's not all the way here yet. We still do wait for the rest of it to come. We have a preview of the real thing, but it's not the whole thing. So maybe the fact that we're in between communion meals is appropriate. 
reminding us where we are in the history of God's salvation. And so in the meantime, we continue to wait. We continue to wait for the full kingdom of God to come. And while we wait, we care about the places in our lives. We care about the people in our lives and the people outside of our lives, outside of our circle of friends. And we care about the fact that God cares about our waiting. It gives us a chance to recognize God's presence in our lives now while we wait. And if we do that, if we can be a people who wait by caring about place and about other people, if we can live that way, then we can't help but give the rest of the world a preview of what the kingdom will be like. We can't help but live a sacramental life, one that makes God's grace more and more visible and shows people what heaven will really be like. May this be so with God's help. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.